Hello and welcome to the Kick in the Creatives podcast, hosted by myself, Sandra Busby, and my fellow creative, Tara Roskell, offering you interviews, inspiration, motivation, and a gentle prod in the right direction. And for lots more information, challenges, and other useful tools to help you get creating, you can go to www.kickinthecreatives.com. And of course, this is where you can also find today's show notes. Enjoy the show. So welcome to today's episode where we're going to talk about why artists and writers often live with guilt and how to overcome it. But before we get on to that, as always, we want to thank everyone who's been sharing their work for the challenges with us on social media. It's a bit early to comment on July's work just yet because we're recording this um, on the 3rd, but June was just a feast for the eyes wasn't it Tara and the people I think were sharing were were just amazing we had um cartoon in June that was really popular really fun to follow did you see um Gabriella Pop yeah loved her stuff and she was doing two wasn't she she wasn't just doing the cartoon one she did another challenge as well yeah she she well she's doing the kick 365 isn't she where she's doing 365 um drawings all days in a row sort of thing but she's kind of She's doing it to fit in with the monthly challenges, if you know what I mean. So I think it's all um, like self-portraits. So this time she was making these really fun cartoons of what she was doing at the, on the day. And I think it's a really good way of keeping things fresh for Gabriella as, as she goes through this Kick 365, because that's quite, that takes a lot of self-discipline, that one, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Mm. And we had Copious June as well, and we had some amazing work for that. Really, really amazing. Julie Turner, did you see her? She did some really lovely copies of the work of Dagar, like the ballerinas. They were really beautiful. Sure yeah, I probably did. And, yeah, and um, Avril Martin Teasdale, did you see her paintings? They were amazing. She did the one um, with a girl with a pearl earring by Vermeer. Did you see that one? I think I did see that one, yeah. I mean, I could go on, quite honestly, as always, because there's just always so much to choose from. But um, what about you? What, what caught your eye? You know, at the cartoon in June, Bradley Bergen, if, did you see his cartoons? They were just really yeah. simple black and white ones. But the great thing was that he announced that he'd actually just got his first cartoon commission. Which is fantastic. Oh, that's amazing. I didn't know that. Yeah, which is brilliant. Uh, and then I've also loved some of Deb Sane's semi-abstract faces that she's been doing for Kick 365. Have you mm. seen these? Yes, I have, yeah. Oh, I really like it. She's been doing these faces and like the kind of eyes are wonky, but in a good way. Uh, yeah. yeah, they're quite quirky. I really like those. Well, and- let's hope that was purpose. Otherwise, you just pointed it out. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely purposeful. <laughs> and then I've also been really impressed by Paula Jeffrey, who over the months she's done a first draft of a sweet romance novel, and she's also drawn a cartoon that's related to it each time. Yeah, I've seen those, and she's she's been kind of putting her word count for the day, hasn't she? On in the corner, is that the one you mean? That's the one. And she said she was actually inspired uh, by hearing the podcast that you did with Jackie Penn, who writes sweet romance novels. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, I'm so pleased to hear that. I'm sure Jackie would be really pleased to hear that. And I've been so impressed with her word count because it's, I don't know how many thousands of words she's doing every day, but the numbers just go up and up. It's amazing. She got to, was it nearly 50,000 in a month? Yeah. And then she, I think she flagged for the last sort of, I remember her doing a post where she's like, oh, starting to flag now. And I sort of said, right, just come on, one more push. You can do it. She didn't know whether I think to finish it there or what. And I just thought at this stage, just do everything you can. And, you know, because you've done so much. Don't leave it if, you know, if you think there's any more to do. But uh, she's done amazing. It'd be really interesting to know, you know, where she goes with this and what happens. I think she's doing editing next. And I said, you know, we'd love to see a few snippets when she's edited. Yeah, yeah, definitely. When she's made her millions, just, uh, you know, remember us, Paula. (laughs) Okay, so what's new with you then, Sandra? Well, the children's book that we wrote together for the February Fables Challenge last year, was last year, wasn't it? Yeah, it must have been. Um, That's just come back from the proofreader slash editor. So that's really exciting. And um, it means that now I've started trying out some illustrations. And illustrating is totally new to me it's it's not really easy to adapt either as a kind of oil painter (laughs) going into these like little illustrations it's quite hard but I'm determined to have a go um I'm having fun experimenting with different styles 
Um, I've been having a go at digital art, so I'm getting the hang of that, actually. Um, But I'm also looking at other illustrators for inspiration, Um, people like Quentin Blake and Tony Scott, and they illustrated the David uh, Williams books. So I'm trying to decide between kind of simple pen and ink sketches and something a bit more detailed. But to be honest, I think the secret's going to be to keep it simple. Um, But yeah, that's really exciting. And the editor, I don't know if I told you this, Dara, but when she came back to me, she said, um, oh, um, this very much looks like it could be a series. I look forward to working with you again. (laughs) Oh, dear. Let's wait and see how this one goes first. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't have the sticking power to write another one. No, <laughs> no, we had fun though, didn't we? It's, it's great. I've been really enjoying. I think know, the it was actually definitely more your thing that one. <clears throat> yeah, I love writing. I yeah. just love writing. Uh, what else? Oh, also Adele, my daughter, um, she took me to the Royal Academy of Arts for afternoon tea last weekend, and it was the hottest day of the year so far, and it reached. I think it was thirty-four degrees in London. <laughs> And Adele is heavily pregnant, so she's got six weeks to go. So how she managed, I don't know. Um, But it was a really fun day, although it wasn't quite what we were expecting. Um, I would say anyone who's doubtful about their artwork, just go to the Royal Academy. You'll feel just great. (laughs) You know, you've been, haven't you, Tara? I think you sort of said to me about it once and, you know... I just kind of think it's strange because it's a very prestigious place, isn't it? The Royal Art Academy. And, you know, and I was fascinated to see all the, um, you know, like the lecture rooms and all these amazing sculptures where obviously they they learn from. Um, but what was surprising, I think, is the actual art itself that was being produced. And maybe I'm hitting a shady area here, but I kind of think that, I always think that art is like a record isn't it of how we've lived throughout history and to be honest if that's what new artists are producing i think future generations are going to think we're a load of sexually obsessed bordering on deranged human beings quite honestly most of it was bonkers but it was really eye-opening it really was and and it was quite funny because we when we walked in there was this um i mean if you could really stereotype an artist <laughs> this guy he had a mullet um and nothing wrong with a mullet but he had the elton john glasses and the, the wacky clothes and and we said oh you know we'd love to see some paintings can you point us in the direction of the paintings and he he kind of looked at us sideways as if to say paintings and he said oh well there are a few about he said there's a lot of el- installations and i mean we walked into one room and there's this kind of big um hump I don't know what it was, on the floor, made of PVA, I think, not PVA, what's it called, PVC? (laughs) PVA, PVC and duct tape. And I don't know what it was, but it was in the middle of the room and we're just staring at it and then you could sort of pick up these headphones and put them on and it was just kind of violin music screaming in the background and none of it really made any sense. Did it even look good? Honestly, didn't look like anything. I mean, okay, yes, it was thought-provoking, but... Not for the right reasons. The The only thought it provoked was, what on earth am I looking at? It's making you ask questions, but it's not really making you ask questions for the right reasons. It's just sticking... It's like sticking a hand dryer on the wall and saying, yeah. that's art. I think, just think it's really pretentious. And I'm sure people who love this type of art will will think we're... Um, yeah. Oh, no. I mean, there's... It, you know there's something for everyone and there are people that enjoy that stuff but there was one um, room as well it had like a blow up it looked like a blow up banana skin that deflated um at human size you know <laughs> and Adele was just saying to me mum what am I looking at what what am I looking at and the couple of the few paintings that were there well I kind of <laughs> I spoke to you about this yeah, didn't you I did. Tara yeah I yeah. can't really they, talk about this one no I can't really talk about this um because it might offend but that's the point I think a lot of the stuff they're painting is just basically there to try and shock and I don't understand why why do we why do they feel the need to do that and this generation it's, it's strange I, I find it odd but I, there you go you know, that's I, just an opinion I think like the picture you showed me that was too explicit to actually sort of say too much about mm, but I yeah. think if they did it in a way that was really amazingly artistic or something you'd at least say oh okay you know uh, there's some merit in it 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. As in, yeah. it looked like an amazing abstract or semi-abstract yeah. horse, yeah. but it didn't, did it? No, no, that was right in your face, yeah. wasn't it? Quite yeah. literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just find it odd. But it, there is, you know, like we said, you know, some people love that stuff and that's fair enough. That's great. Um, but yeah, I suppose it's something for everyone, isn't there? So anyway, what about you, Tara? What is new with you? Well, I organised another sketch group. You know, I did that uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, I did another one. There were four of us this time and we ended up drawing in exactly the same pub as last time because it was raining <laughs> again. <laughs> but it was quite fun because I drew a few of the people, you know, in, in the pub. I actually drew one of the guys who was there. I actually drew both the guys who were there. So I drew them then did a street view and... Then we really did a fun thing where we did three minute time drawings of each other. And luckily we were in a little off room, room off to the side of the pub. So there was no one really in there. So we were standing up and had to pose for each other for three minutes, fully clothed. Did, obviously. did you keep your clothes on? Yeah. That's what I was going to yeah. say. <laughs> fully clothed. So we were just doing three minute sketches. So that was fun. Um, and then also I went on another sketching day with my friend Lisa. Um, she doesn't normally draw, but a while ago she said she really fancied doing something crafty. And I said, oh, why don't you draw? And she said, well, I can't. And I said, well, come on. Yes, she, anybody can draw. So let me, you know, let's go out and I'll teach you a little bit. So that was really fun. We went to this house, like, um, I don't know what you call them, like an estate type thing, an old estate. Yeah. And yeah. it was this house that was sort of partially in ruins, so some of it hadn't got the brief on, some had, but it was absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous day. There was like lovely gardens. So we sat and we drew this kind of, I don't know, what was some sort of urn type thing in, in the garden. And then we we sat down and we drew, drew a statue. So that, that was good fun. And she seemed to really enjoy it, which was great. And, and was she surprised at what she achieved or? Yeah, she was really pleased with the first one she did because I just showed her how to measure, you know, by holding out your pencil and just showed her to drop a, a middle line just so she could kind of get things roughly symmetrical-ish. You know what I mean? Yeah, to- yeah. So- Is that a word? <laughs> That's our new word, symmetrical-ish. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> she, she was really pleased. She said her grandkids thought it was really good. So there we go. She got oh, grandkid approval. Um, and then she did the statue. So I showed her the pen and ink and water technique. So yeah. using fine liners, and she absolutely loved that technique. And she did the statue like that, but it was quite funny because um, she ran out of room for the head. <laughs> Why didn't you start with the head first? Because normally, if you were drawing a statue, you'd start with the head, wouldn't you? In general, yeah, yeah, I would. Because <laughs> I knew I'd find that bit hard, so I thought I'd leave it to the end. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then I had no space left. <laughs> <laughs> oh brilliant oh, so yeah. is she gonna do it again yeah she wants to I um, she's got stuff going on at the moment but when when she's a bit quieter yeah hopefully she seemed quite keen so well the thing is like you say anyone can draw it's just a matter of wanting to or wanting to be able to do it. I think people that actually can't are just people aren't interested but I think the people that say they can't they often want to, but they don't really know where to start. So yeah, she said it was yeah. really meditative as well because she mm. started crocheting as well. So she said it's almost like that where you can kind of get lost in it. Yeah, yeah, you do. I mean, I've always said that when I draw or paint, it's the one time when my brain actually can sleep or can re- relax and rest, and there's not a million and one things going around my head yeah. and things I've got to do. So. Yeah, I totally get that. I totally get that. It's great. But um, yeah, should we get on to today's episode, which is uh, we're going to talk about why artists and writers often live with guilt and how to overcome it. And and this is a subject I really wanted to cover because it's something I've struggled a lot with myself. And, um, you know, although everyone can feel guilty at times, I think the problem for creatives is that they tend to get a kind of double dose of it because, you know, artists and writers, they can feel guilty when they are creating, but they can also feel guilty when they're not. So it, it's kind of finding a balance and that's what's really important. So we're going to look at today why we are um, feeling guilty in the first place and um, the main things that make us feel guilty and ways that we can create a balance and overcome those feelings as much as possible. Yeah, I think one of the things that makes us feel guilty is the fact that when we create art, it's fun. Well, it should be anyway, unless it's going wrong, and we enjoy it. And it's really odd that we should feel like that 
But a lot of people around us can make us feel that what we're doing is frivolous compared to doing other stuff that we have to do, like, you know, the chores or, you know, being with family. Not that being with family is a chore. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) And because of this, you can end up putting off your art or writing. You put it right down your list of priorities because you think there are other things that you should be doing. But that's really a mistake because if you're creating art and doing things that you should be doing – you know, it really does help make you feel better, doesn't it? And creativity really does demand a certain amount of self-discipline and and a bit of consistency. Oh, definitely. I think, like you say, one of the most obvious things that we need to keep up with is the household chores. I mean, if the ironing has piled up or, you know, the hoovering needs to be done, well, you know, we know we're going to feel really bad when everyone gets home and none of that's been done. But instead, you've got a lovely book um, that you're writing that's nearly finished or an illustration, you know, done. Um, it's, It's strange. I mean, the house, the thing about housework is that you know, a few hours after you've done it, I don't know about your house, but in my house, a few hours after I've done it, it kind of needs to be done again anyway. So it's a kind of constant thing we have to keep on top of. You you look around and you think, oh God, I've got to do it. I only did it two days ago and I've got to do the whole lot again. But, you know, a book does not write itself. And once it's done, it's done. You can get on to the next thing. Do you know what I mean? So I'm not obviously saying we shouldn't clean our homes at all, but I do think that we should certainly put that lower down on the list of priorities because, you know, we don't need to set aside a big chunk of time for housework. Instead, you kind of fit that into small pockets of time during the day. So, for example, I don't know if you've got 10 minutes free while, I don't know, potatoes are boiling, you can whip the hoover around. You can do a little bit every day rather than doing the whole you know, house in one go. And you can't do that with a lot of creative pursuits because they demand like a decent chunk of time and a lot of concentration. So you you need to set aside a proper chunk of time for those things and make it a priority, I think. Yeah, I mean, you can mix it up a bit as well, can't you? I mean, you could always do, I'm going to do, because obviously you could do a 10 minute drawing. I know you said uh, things need a lot of time, but there are things that you can fit into smaller chunks. So you yeah. could try and combine it a bit. Okay, I will do my hoovering once I've done 10 minutes of art or whatever. Or you can draw your hoover. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite lucky that Kevin is a bit OCD with the old hoovering. So it's he. Yes, yeah, so you have to do. You, well, we've both got Labradors, haven't we? So <laughs> you have to. You have to be good with a hoover. Yeah. <laughs> but another thing you could do to make yourself extra time is get up an hour before everyone else does. And I remember someone doing this last year, and I wish I could remember remember who it was. That now, was you, wasn't it? No, but we had someone in our group. Oh, okay, who, yeah. Who early rise August last year, and she said it completely changed things for her and she really wished she'd done it years ago she said that hour before anyone else got up it was her time you know she didn't need to feel guilty because she was making that extra time and there was nothing else she should have been doing you know she'd just normally be lying in bed now I know you did you challenged me to do this a while back didn't you yeah so I got up for a while um well, it was last hour. August, wasn't it? Was it early... Last August, yeah. I think you did. Did you not do the early rise? No, August? I think... or was it? Or did did I challenge you separately before yeah, think, we created was, that challenge? It was a random one, I think, when we were talking about time management. Okay, yeah. So you challenged me to get up an hour earlier, which I did. Um, but to be honest, I didn't necessarily use it for creativity. I use it to get other things out of the way. I don't think I'm particularly a morning person. But the good thing was, if I cleared. The other bits of work that I had to do, that meant I could spend time doing something creative a bit later. And I know you did it as well, didn't you? You had a while where you would get up earlier and do some sketching. Yeah, I, th- I think I started doing that about three years ago. I, I used to, um, obviously, because I'm not a morning person either. I'm really not. I hate mornings. <laughs> um, but days are really, I don't know, you're, you're kind of charging around all the time, aren't you? And I never found time to relax. So the what I used to do, which is bizarre now, really, when I think about it, but I used to get up an hour earlier and I used to use that time to just sort of sit and have my coffee and watch a bit of the telly that um, Paul doesn't like and just do things like that. And then after a while, I I remember thinking I could actually be using this time to to do some drawing rather than sitting down watching TV because it did seem still like a bit of a waste of time. So that's what I started doing. I started um, getting up and then going into my art room and doing some sketching. And I used to use that hour for that. And um, and actually, I filled a sketchbook in 
a matter of, I don't know, a couple of months, whereas I wouldn't have, you know, in a million years didn't have done that. It would have been an empty sketchbook because I could never find the time. And to this day, I've been doing it ever since. I've never gone back to going, you know, to staying in bed. But like you say, you don't have to do it for doing creative work. What you can do is you can think, right, I'm going to get up an hour early. I'm going to do that housework that needs to be done or hang the washing out, whatever else needs to be done. And then that gives me time free later on to to do the sketching or whatever you want to do. So um, so I never stopped because it made such a difference to how much I could get done. Um, sometimes I, as well, I'd, I'd even use that time to prepare the dinner. You know, when you I don't know, this is more in the winter. So I've got a slow cooker. They're so good. And you can kind of throw things in the slow cooker. Um, and then it means that when you've finished work, the, the dinner's kind of already ready. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't have to do anything. So that I'd do it. I'd sometimes do that as well. But yeah, I mean, ideally it, it should be used specifically, I think, for creativity, because that way, you know, you've devoted an hour to that before your day even begins. But I suppose that depends when you feel most creative in the day, I suppose. Yeah. And I think even if your art is just a hobby, don't make it a really low priority because art and any kind of creativity is not only something you enjoy, but often it's something that helps your general well-being and mood. I mean, and I'm sure your family will appreciate it if you're in a better mood. I know my other half does. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So think about, about it as looking after yourself and that you're in a better frame of mind when you spend that quality time with your friends and family. I know I feel better when I've done something creative and it doesn't even necessarily have to be drawing. It could be writing or making videos, but it makes me feel a lot happier. Like when we went to London, um, I can't remember where we went now, a few weeks ago, wasn't it? Yeah, about ago. Four, three or four weeks ago. But the day or two after, I felt very upbeat because yeah. you spent that day, you know, outside sketching and, you know, doing something nice. Yeah. It's understandable that you might not be able to warrant spending as much time on your creativity if you're not earning anything from it. Are you talking about, you know, it being a hobby? But I don't think that makes it any less of an important thing to do. Um, like you say, apart from it makes you feel really good. Um, but this is where I think time management plays an important part. And we actually did an entire episode on time management. I think it was episode 23. So if you do struggle with that, you might find it useful to go back and have a listen to that particular episode. Um, but you might not have any choice but to fit your art into small pockets of time wherever you can find it, such as, I don't know, lunch breaks, um, a commute to work, waiting in the car or before breakfast. I mean, that's where I think getting up an hour earlier is so good because you can devote that one hour every day to your art and feel no guilt whatsoever because, like you say, you'd usually be in bed anyway. And it's surprising, I think, how how quickly you get used to that new routine. I find now that I kind of naturally wake up at that time anyway. What about you, Tara? Did, did you stick to it? I can't remember. No. <laughs> <laughs> you no, I really don't. I mean, I, I'm probably quite lucky. I have uh, quite a lot of time to myself. Or, although I tend to now dedicate a lot of it to kicking the creatives, which is yeah. so it's like irony, isn't it? That instead yeah. of drawing, I'm doing kicking the creative stuff because, you know, I haven't got kids and I work freelance. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm probably quite lucky that way. So, no, I didn't. But actually, I, I did I did that Miracle Morning as well that you've done before. And yeah. doing that, I really enjoyed because that's made up of all different things you do in the morning. And I really enjoyed stuff like even just reading. I know it's not necessarily creative in the sense of output, but that input even helps to get new ideas, doesn't it? You know, taking in these new inspiration from all different places. So, yeah, I should do, but I like my sleep. <laughs> Yeah, I found that Miracle Morning, kind of liked it, but I didn't find it productive, if you know what I mean. I liked the fact that I was, oh, I'm making time to sit here in silence and or write something, but I just didn't, I didn't feel it was, it wasn't really for me, I don't think. I didn't feel that I'd got much out of it, but some people swear by it, don't they? I've heard lots of people um, on various interviews saying about the Miracle Morning and saying it was absolutely fantastic and changed changed their life, you know. Yeah, I, I think you need to adapt something like that to you, don't you? Because yeah. sometimes you're, you're sitting there and you're, you're doing the writing bit or you're doing the meditation bit purely because someone has told you that is what or you should be doing. And, of course, all it is is something that someone's made up because it's worked for them. But 
it's not a yeah. one size fits all type thing, is it? Well, no, because for a start, one of the things to do was go for a run, and there is no way in a million years I'm going for a run in the morning. <laughs> well, it was exercise, wasn't it, rather than go for a yeah. run? So you could have well, you yeah. could have done yoga or anything. No, well, well, I kind of made it. I adapted it to suit me, and the fact that meditation for me was drawing because that I do find meditative, you know. Yeah. And and the run, going for a run. Well, no, I would go for a really brisk walk with the dog. So that was fine. You do have to make it work for you. Yeah. But for the foremost I wanted it to make me feel more uh, alert for drawing and, and you know when you sort of feel raring to go do you yeah, know what I mean energized and it, it did work it did work for that but I kind of in the end I thought no I'm gonna I'm gonna use I'm just gonna use it to get things done yeah. really and you you were saying how um you know when people are doing their art they feel guilty you know because it's not something they have to do it's kind of a bit frivolous yeah but those guilty feelings they can even apply if you're actually doing it for your career you know if you're a full-time creative and you're earning you can still feel guilty because you're enjoying your work well wouldn't that be fantastic to be enjoying your work (laughs) (laughs) because you might look around you and see that while you're enjoying what you do other people don't so that makes you feel a little bit guilty too you've got this voice inside you that says I don't know why we do this that we shouldn't enjoy what we're doing and when we do, it makes us feel that it's wrong somehow. I so agree with that. It is it is weird, isn't it? I mean, if we were doing something we didn't enjoy, it we'd feel fine about it. Yeah, it's, it's like, like that say, work play sort of breakdown, isn't it? That hard line. Mm, mm, exactly. And I think another reason for feeling guilty, even when you're earning from it, is because you know there's no guarantee that your work will sell. So it can still feel like you should be doing other things. I mean, sometimes I'll spend you know days on a painting, and yeah, I don't know if it's going to sell. And um, you know, painting is quite an expensive thing to do. Materials aren't cheap, so you have to do it for love because, in a sense, you're always gambling, really. But I think in the case of writers in particular, you can feel guilty because you need plenty of alone time and it can take months to get something finished. And yet there's no guarantee that a book's going to make any money at all. I mean, you know, there's no question you've got to love what you're doing. But I often think about writers, you know, because especially when we were doing Floss, I won't tell anyone the story yet. We'll do an episode on that when we've published her. (laughs) But, you know, I remember sitting there writing and I just was so absorbed in it. I loved it. But if I knew I should be some doing something else, I feel really bad. But imagine if you were a novelist that did that for a living. You have to kind of cage yourself away from everyone because I don't know about anyone else, but drawing you can do when other people are around. But writing, you know, I have to be totally in the zone and with no um, distractions at all. So if you're perhaps somebody who's married with a family who has to put that time in to writing, presumably they'd have to go away into their room and spend a certain number of hours on it a day to do so many words a day. That must be quite hard because, you know, like we've said before, there's no guarantee that book's going to no. it's gonna sell. So, yeah. I mean, I've done stuff like that in the past where um, I've created characters like, do you, I don't know if you remember my weather pops. But I no, I don't yeah, remember that. I've got some kids' characters. No, I did. Oh, it's years ago now. But I was really te- determined I was going to do something with with it. And I went, did a show in London. I mean, it, the, to put on that exhibition and you know, of li- it was all licensing companies to go there. Yeah. It was a couple of thousand pounds. I really put money into this thing, and um, loads of time. So I'd be sh- sh- shutting myself in my office. You know, maybe at the weekends or evenings. Um, when Kevin was around and I'd be working on this thing and of course in the end nothing comes comes of it so you think you feel a bit like you've wasted that time when you could have been I could have been spent you know spending doing other other things spending it with people but it's that thing where you never know and you almost have to you feel that urge that you have to do it if I hadn't have done it I'd never known if it was going to work or not it, that's so right yeah I mean sometimes you just have to take that gamble don't you yeah. and as long as you love it you know you must have felt good doing it oh well yeah because you feel this achievement like you've created something out of nothing I'd created yeah. this world uh, and I had lots of people interested and I had meetings and oh you would not believe how long it went on for but yeah such a shame but yeah. I mean even we're dabbling with things now aren't we like um, we've been some designed some t-shirts and some notebooks And we're doing those, and although that's not costing you a lot of money, we're putting time in, and you're thinking, 
is it worth putting this time in? Should we be spending this with time with people or draw? Yeah. Even how you should allot your time. Should it be drawing? Should it be, you know, doing design? It's all all a bit of a a juggle, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Like you say, everything costs money, doesn't it, as well? Money or time, I think, mm. one or the other. Um, and, you know, publishing a book costs money. Like you said, we were working on Floss um, and you've got the editor to check it for us. And, of course, that costs a little bit of money, doesn't it? Yeah, but, yeah. So, you know, you might feel guilty that you're spending on something, like you say, that there's no guarantees for. And that also implies to other forms of art painting can be really expensive just buying canvases and paints but I think one thing that is really good is that when I was a teenager and I used to love to paint everything used to cost an absolute fortune and obviously if you're looking to do artist standard type things now it still is quite expensive because obviously you're because you're selling your paints professionally Sandra you want to use really good canvases and really good paints yeah I was just about to say that because I mean when you're a hobbyist it doesn't matter you can use sort of cheap canvases and, yeah. and student quality paints and that's fine but when you are selling you have to use the the you know cream of the cream if you know what I mean so and that does cost a lot of money but when I was a teenager if I wanted to do a painting yes there was student quality but even student quality was quite expensive whereas now yeah. you can go to you know your you know these general stores that sell a bit of everything yeah like hobby craft yeah. places well, like that hobby yeah. craft or even like these b&m type places these houseware yeah. type places and there'll be a little yeah. section for art and you'll pick up canvas and, and there might be like a couple of pounds or something well yeah. when i was a kid it would have cost more than that that was that many years ago yeah because you you like the works don't you and i think they sell really cheap canvases yeah, so anyway, like that. that's yeah, when when you're a hobbyist, it's great because you just don't have to worry. It's about do it. It's about the practice rather than you haven't got to hope that something's going to last for fifty years. Yeah, <laughs> you know exactly. I mean? uh, but obviously, you want to make sure it's the quality that it's not hindering you. But oh yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Oh yeah, that can be a mistake yeah. if you use really cheap stuff. Then you won't enjoy doing it because yeah. you know. But no, I agree. I, I think the cost is so worth it when you think of how much you know we get out of it mentally yeah i think that it's kind of like an investment into feeling content and happy really i mean you know i feel completely different when i've had a day in the art studio or i've been productive um creatively completely different to when i do when i come out of my non-creative job um unfulfilled and discontent really um you might feel guilty making art if your family are demanding a lot of your time or, you know, even if they're not, but you know that they're not doing anything themselves. I mean, my kids have grown up now and Charlie's the last one in the nest and he's sort of thinking about leaving now. So I haven't got to think about children or anything like that. But if Paul is at home, you know, there are times when I'm in the art room making these videos that we do or and he never makes me feel guilty. He never, he wouldn't. But it's something about how I feel. Somehow I can can be sitting there trying to do an illustration for the book and during the time it's taken me to do one illustration he's mowed the lawn cleaned out the gutters emptied the bins he's he makes himself look so busy and then I feel so bad because I think I just feel so guilty but um I think that's when setting aside some time when everyone works on their own creative pastime or hobby can help so um Paul, for instance, he loves fly fishing and it's really great when it's fly fishing season because then he'll go off and do a day's fly fishing and then I don't care. I can do whatever I want. It's brilliant. Or perhaps when he's watching something on the TV that I don't like, so perhaps he might be watching football. Um, but again, that's a seasonal thing. But then that's when I can sit there with my iPad and look at illustrating or something like that. Yeah, what um, I like about that as well with the TV thing is like Kevin will sit and watch football and I could sit and write so I might sit and you know write something for us or I might sit there and I could just sketch because it it doesn't matter it's not bothering him but we're together but we're doing different things yeah that's so true the thing is I can't write when there's any noise isn't that weird I can write I'll tell you how I can write and actually um have you ever had those uh recordings of like thunderstorms and things yeah. like that and rain and things like that and there's also one I think that's like a cafe isn't there with people oh, in coffee yeah, shop yeah. I can write in that environment with that noise but I cannot write with any anybody talking in the background I don't know what it is it's a bit like if you're trying to if you're working with numbers and somebody's reeling out numbers in the background yeah. 
I just can't do it. <laughs> but when he does, um, I don't know, when he's otherwise engaged doing whatever, that's when I can get a lot of my things done for kicking the creative. Say, for instance, finding images for our prompts, which I've been doing some of, you know, recently. I can, I can do that while he's watching the football or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I do think it must be a lot harder when the people around you don't have hobbies of their own and not everyone does and I always think it's you know such a shame because I think everybody needs some they need to find something they love doing but if it must be hard if you've got a husband or children who don't have any hobbies and are just relying on you to kind of entertain them yeah yeah no yeah but I think you can even sort of like when we're on holiday and I, I told you we had terrible weather this holiday and it just absolutely it chucked it down pretty much the whole time like yeah. kevin was trying to find something to do because we got the dog with us so he couldn't really go out to places as such so he was just doing a jigsaw and so i was using that to my advantage because i thought well i want to practice drawing people moving and of course his head's going up and down constantly looking for bits so he's doing a <laughs> jigsaw and i'm trying to draw his face <laughs> <laughs> bloke, I've got pages of about 20 faces, all of not very good because he's moving and I'm trying to capture it. But, you know, you, you can just try and use that. So you could even set, you could set if your kids or whatever, you could get them to play a board game together. You set it and sit there and draw them. Yeah, or ask them to post for you and make them part of it. Yeah, you could make... You know, get, uh, say, right, I'll give you a pound if you stand there for five minutes. <laughs> you know, you can just try and involve them, I suppose. That's a good idea. I know that what you were saying about holiday, it's funny because when we went to Cuba earlier this year, um, <clears throat> Paul was, he, you know, laying in the sun and I was sitting there sketching him. But it's quite funny because he was a sort of sleep... And then he'd start moving. I'd be like, don't move. <laughs> and then there'd be the waitress would come over. And I remember her looking over my shoulder at what I was drawing. And then so she's staring at my sketch and then she's staring at him. And then poor guy, he's just sort of laying there trying to sunbathe. <laughs> and then once she's gone, somebody else comes over. And it's quite funny, really. But yeah, that's a good idea, actually, just to try to get them involved somehow, you know. No, I have to read this out, but you wrote it, so I'm going to blame you. So it says, or maybe your spouse will let you practice live drawing. <laughs> and I changed the next bit because we couldn't read out what you'd written. So I'm going to say, just make sure you're in a warm room for them to pose in and don't let yourself get distracted. Because that's the <laughs> thin version of what was written down <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's important, I think, to make your family understand just how important it is to you and what it means to you and that you'll be a better person and a happier, con more contented person. And this can only benefit them in the long run, too. I think you can always sense when a person is discontented and I think those negative feelings can be so infectious. So don't see it as being selfish at all. If you're happy and content, then it benefits everyone. And that's why I no longer feel guilty now when I sort of come in and think, oh, I haven't done the housework. Because I do it, but it always gets done, but it'll get done when it's good for me and not necessarily when it's good for everyone else because that's just how, how it has to be. So like I said, you can you can ask them to help. Um, you can even ask them to help you think of ideas so they feel more like a part of your creativity rather than just like an onlooker. And I've done this loads in the past. I mean, my family have helped me with photo shoots. For example, um, I needed an egg dipper for my egg and soldiers painting, which is on my website if anyone wants to see what I'm talking about. So my daughter Adele, she helped me with that one. Um, she came around one day and said, Adele, I need you to... Um, hold this soldier into this egg and just stand there for about three minutes <laughs> she was like oh god mum what are you on about um paul was my hand model in a recent painting i did um and charlie he's quietly creative he really is and often he comes up with really good ideas for me so you know it's it's really nice to have their input and it makes me feel like they're a big part of what i do and i actually think they appreciate that i value their input as well um, I mean, if you're a writer, again, you could ask your family for ideas on how to develop your story if you're a bit stuck or how to build your characters. I think family can be really helpful. And I think that's something that's a kind of way of getting them involved, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think I've mentioned before how Kevin used to help me come up with names for work. Sometimes I'd get commissioned to 
come up with a name for like a product or some sort of service that someone was offering. So what we do is have a few glasses of wine on a Friday night and then it was much more fun and we <laughs> for it. And we'd get rather silly and and sometimes even the silliest we'd come up with the silliest names and it'd even get picked. So yeah, that yeah. that was really fun. Do you remember the um painting I did of the um cigar and the rum? Yes. Well, that was just going to be that. I was going to do a painting of cigar and rum because I'd, I'd bought this um, rum from Cuba and a cigar and I was really quite inspired, really, and I'd always wanted to, to paint a cigar. And funny enough, it was Charlie who said, Mum, why don't you add um, like a hand of cards to go with it? Because Cuba, actually, they have quite a gambling history, not now, but back in the past. And he said it would be really good if you put a, um, like a, a royal flush next to it or something like that. And I thought, wow, that's a really good idea. So it was only because of Charlie that that painting includes a pack of cards and it really worked really well. Yeah, because that really adds a light to the dark, doesn't it? Yeah, and it does, and colour as well. Yeah. A bit of colour with the red hearts or whatever. So somebody who says they're not creative, often they really are and they just don't know it. So even if your family say they're not creative... They can be a big help without you even without them even realizing. Yeah, I mean Kevin's quite good at spotting things, and I know you said Paul is because he's colorblind. Spotting mm. things that don't work on a design, or I say, you know, why why doesn't this work? And he might say, oh, that's too big, or that's too small. So that that's really useful as well. And it's just Do- Kevin colorblind. No, no, but sorry, I meant I know Paul because he's colorblind. He's very yeah. good at spotting composition errors. Uh, yeah. I- I'll explain that really quickly because everyone must be thinking, yeah. what on earth are they talking about? Basically, and I learned this from a lady called Rosa Branson, who I used to paint with sometimes. And if um, somebody who is colourblind will often, um, they'll see problems with pattern or they'll see patterns that might you might not. So in other words, I remember when I was doing the bubble painting, I did a, a, a sort of few bubbles sort of floating across the canvas. And just before I started actually painting it, Paul, I said to Paul, is there anything about this you can see that isn't right composition wise before I start adding the colour? And he said, yeah, he said, um, there's three bubbles there that form a perfect diagonal line now this is something that uh, this is stuff that i know that's not a great composition but i couldn't see it for some reason and he he did yeah so he's very helpful in that way yeah is it sorry just, i've interrupted no, you it's just a second pair of eyes i think sometimes i mean sometimes you can spot those mistakes yourself if you look the next day or look yeah. in a mirror but sometimes you do need someone to tell you because you just you've just looked at it so much that you can't see yeah. it yeah i think another way you might start feeling guilty is if you're really enjoying your own creative time but you know like friends or family are having a real bad time like we feel like we shouldn't be enjoying ourselves if someone else isn't and i know you had a really big creative block didn't you sandra do you want to talk about that a little bit yeah i will um that was last year um i had a really bad year actually and um we interviewed Jake Parker, didn't we? Yeah. And it was funny because I'd been going through a significant block at that time and I was still in it when we interviewed him, which was why I asked him if he's ever experienced an artist block. And uh, he actually went really deeply into that subject, which led us doing an, a whole episode on creative blocks, which, by the way, was episode 21, if anyone wants to go back and listen to that. But Jake talked about what he called shallow blocks, and then he went on to the deep blocks and the causes behind them. And it was only after we spoke to Jake that I was able to see what was causing my own block at the time. And I think the only way to get past the block is to establish the root and the trigger behind it, which, thanks to that interview, I was able to do almost immediately. It was kind of unravelling as we were talking. It was quite strange, really. But to cut a really long story short, um, I managed to work out that I was associating my painting time with feelings of guilt. And this was because earlier in the year we'd lost one of our close friends um and very soon after that we lost my father-in-law and of course you know there were some significant people around me going through hell at the time and I think when I'm painting or drawing I I feel really happy and um well certainly when it's going well anyway but I think 
that was making me feel guilty because everyone else around me was feeling so awful. So I found that I just couldn't go in the studio because feeling good was made making me feel really bad, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Um, and it was only when I understood those reasons that I was able to get back into the studio again. Funny, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, ultimately, guilt does absolutely nothing for us. If you're a creative person, you need to create and you shouldn't feel guilty about it. The people who, you know, love you and care about you, they wouldn't want you to feel that way anyway. And the people who don't, well, they don't really matter at all. No, exactly, exactly. So shall we move on to what our last time's question was? Yeah. So it was, and I'm surprised we got any answers for this one because it was slightly bonkers. Um, what <laughs> is the wildest thing you've ever done with your art materials? <laughs> God, I'm going to ask you then, Tara. What's We've the been discussing you... it last time. Oh, yeah. What did you say? I can't I remember. I said I didn't do anything. And then you said rolling around on a canvas with Paul. <laughs> 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 yeah, I remember now. <laughs> so I've got Deb Armstrong. Um, she says, bought really cheap materials and love them. Nothing wrong with that. No. Nope. I've got MJ Stead. And she says, close my eyes, pulled out a handful of paint tubes, and use them to do an entire painting. Challenging. I like that idea. Yeah, yeah. Karen Watty, I used golden matte gel to embed feathers and leaves onto a painted background. It made a beautiful autumn display piece. And best of all, was that if I shared a photo of it, everyone thought I'd painting the, painted the whole thing. <laughs> it's a good bit <laughs> of cheating. Yeah. And then I've got Belinda Lamour, and she says, used a canvas to hang all my earrings on. Just push. I love that. Yeah, clever. <laughs> Just push them through. It was great to see them all instead of forgetting them all at the back of a drawer, but not what the canvas was meant for. I wonder if she painted it first. I don't know. You could make it quite that's nice really... one, couldn't you, if you painted it? That... Yeah, that's a really, really good. I like that idea. Yeah. I'd never have thought of that. You know, to hang, I was going to say brooches. I don't know if anyone wears brooches anymore, but anything like that. Yeah. What a good idea. Brilliant. Um, Nicole Molnar. Is it Molnar? I guess Molnar? so, yeah. Took an X-Acto knife to my erasers and cut them into smaller pieces with nice pointy tips so they're actually useful now. Good idea. And then I've got Dorothy Walker. A stone hedgehog is as wild as I got. <laughs> I think she's taking the other version <laughs> of wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nick Tate West, the guy I did my photography apprentice with, gave me a box of makeup. Since I don't wear such things, I painted it. Sorry, I painted with it on canvases. All right. And I've got Cheryl Martin. She said, I had to think as I've done, done silly things, but the worst was cutting my expensive brushes up to try different looks in painting, and I failed terribly. Also, I tend to add soap liquid to paints and mix things together, such as ink and crushed chalk. And I've got Gabriella Pop, and she showed a picture of her and a young girl throwing paint at a wall. And she says, this was the beginning. Later, we wiped and smeared over and over, took colour away, put new colour in on another way on the wall. In the end, the wall was completely covered. The door, the floor, and me too. That is wild. That is. I think that has to be the wildest yes, out of that lot, too. don't you? Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what really was the wildest thing I ever did with my art materials. Okay. And that was... You didn't put them um, away. That'd be, that'd yeah. be really wild for you, wouldn't it? You left yeah, them really all out. <laughs> no, I used to be a bit of a hoarder when it came to art materials. I was one of these people that always thought I needed everything. And if I saw a, a YouTube video and somebody was doing something amazing, I'd be like, I need that. <laughs> that pen is going to make automatically make me be able to draw like that. <laughs> I remember this. And when I was first starting out, I just bought absolutely everything that I thought might, you know make me a better artist I think and um I've have had everything from oil pastels which I hate I know you like them yeah. um markers I mean stuff that I never ever use anymore and I haven't used for years because since I found oil painting I I've no particular interest in using other stuff um so my wildest thing that I ever did was literally gutting my studio getting rid of absolutely everything I hadn't used for at least a year but the problem now is that now we're doing Kicking the Creatives, I'm experimenting a lot more. And now I'm thinking, oh, I wish I had those oil pastels. I wish I had this and I wish I had that. So wild but silly, that was me. Well, you bought brush pens. You said I haven't used them. I have. have I you? have used them. Yes, I've used them a couple of times, actually. Well, you haven't showed yeah. me. No, I just did some um, sort of coloured... 
I thought I had showed you when I used some uh, coloured sort of sketch in my sketchbook and kind of faded, used, used the um, grey or more muted uh, colours in the background. Yeah, but you yeah. only used one colour, you didn't kind of mix them, um, yeah. Oh no, I haven't, oh no, I haven't gone that wild yet, I haven't added water, what are you, what do you think I am? Great. <laughs> no, I'm taking them to, because we're going to Brighton next week, aren't yeah. we, for another sketching day out, um, so you'll be down my neck of the woods, and uh, yeah, so I'm going to bring them to that day and try them there. No, you're going to take them to that day like you did on London, and then you're not actually going to get them out of your pencil case, are you? <laughs> I'm going to desperately try this yeah. time to, yeah, We're going to do that first, we're going to do that first. Yes, okay. So we've got a question, haven't we? Are you going to read out a new question? Yes, yeah, so the question for this week is, what does your typical creative day look like? So what does your typical creative day look like? And as always, you can tweet us your answers at Kit Creatives or let us know in the Facebook group, which you haven't joined, I suggest you do. And we'll also put the question up in there and on the Facebook page and, of course, on our Instagram page, which is Kick in the Creatives. So don't forget to pop over to our website at kickinthecreatives.com to find out how you can take part in our upcoming challenges. And of course, there you can also subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you are enjoying the podcast, we'd be so grateful if you'd leave us a little review on iTunes or even just a star rating if you don't have much time. It really does mean the world. And of course, don't forget that we've also got Art Kick Sunday YouTube videos now. We have one out every week on a Sunday, so don't forget to subscribe to those. They're lighthearted and fun, but also in informative and um, we make idiots of ourselves basically so have a look at those <laughs> right well we'll chat again soon bye bye thank you so much for listening we hope you enjoyed the episode and if you did perhaps you'd like to share it and leave a review for us on itunes back soon <laughs> tara i just why do I just... Why can't I stop talking? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I add, what happens is I, I write my notes and then I, I ad-lib without realising that, that what I'm saying is part of my notes further down. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, God, oh, I'm a my, gag. Part of my notes further down. Maybe we need to do this um, a video one rather than an audio one then i can you can just look at me and and you know put some sellotape over your mouth as a sign stop talking what if i could put sellotape over my mouth i want to put sellotape over <laughs> your mouth well you can't unless you can reach through the computer <laughs>